Well, Mr. President, first of all, I rise in strong opposition to the amendment by a friend and colleague from Arizona that would wipe out a highly skilled American workforce. And that's nothing less than that is at stake with this amendment. Irreparably damaging our military's combat readiness, deprive our troops in the field of critical resources, and threaten our national security. Those are strong words, but that's what's involved that the adoption of the amendment being offered by the Senate of Arizona would be adopted. I'd like to introduce my colleagues to three workers of Pratt Whitney in Middletown, Connecticut. In this picture here, which you see here, these three individuals working on this engine, <clears throat> they're removing test equipment after completing testing on a powerful, cutting edge engine preparing it for delivery to the United States Air Force. The man on the left is Doug, over here. He's been working at Pratt & Whitney for 24 years, married with three children, eight-year-old twins and a four-year-old. The man in the middle here is Stephen. He spent four years in the Air Force before coming to Pratt & Whitney and boasts a quarter of a century of aviation experience. And on the right is his co-worker Michael, 15 years of experience on the floor and eight as a supervisor at this facility. If we effectively lay off these workers and the 30,000 Americans like them in 43 states who build the C-17, we'll be causing tremendous pain and financial hardship at a time when our communities can least afford it. In my home state of Connecticut, 29th in total population but 6th in total aerospace employment, we just received word that Pratt & Whitney is going to close maintenance facilities in Cheshire, Connecticut and East Hartford, Connecticut, costing 1,000 jobs. If this amendment prevails, my state's largest private employer tells me they will stand to lose another 3,000 jobs. A man like these three, which collectively almost know 100 years of experience in maintaining the industrial base necessary for us to main maintain not parity with the world, but superiority and a critical component of our ability to deliver supplies and, and equipment to men to critical areas of the world. Perhaps my colleagues aren't persuaded by the imminent loss of thousands of jobs. If that were the only argument, I suppose everyone could make one. But I want my colleagues to understand what's at stake if this amendment is adopted. And here, when it comes to at least a critical component in a major part of our country committed to developing this kind of technology. Perhaps some might be tempted to threaten the livelihoods of 30,000 people at a time we can ill afford it. To them, I say, think about these three individuals whose years of experience and competency have allowed us to maintain a level of superiority unparalleled in the world. According to the Air Force, over the last three years, in the military central command alone, the C-17 has flown more than 100,000 airlift sorties, moved more than 2 million personnel, delivered nearly 300,000 tons of cargo, and executed nearly 2,000 airdrops. According to the General Accounting Office, the C-17s have delivered more than 2.4 million tons of cargo to Iraq and Afghanistan alone. Mr. President, that's 2.4 million tons of supplies everything from critical gear to large vehicles, sustaining our troops on the battlefield. The General County Accountability Office also notes that this aircraft has drawn, and I quote, drawn praise during combat operations. And listen to this, with an 86% readiness rate compared to the 53% readiness rate of the 40-year-old C-5 fleet that shares the cargo lift mission with the C-17s. The C-17 is the most reliable airlift plane in our arsenal. And it's also the most versatile. Unlike any other aircraft that we have, the C-17 can complete combat, humanitarian, and other transport, transport missions all over the world, thanks to its unique ability to take off and land in difficult environments, in remote airfields, or in situations where runways are shortened or degraded. The Air Force reports that the C-17 is able to take off and land on 65% of the world's soil, whereas older airlift planes can only land on 6%. This incredible versatility makes the C-17 vital to the success of counterinsurgency, humanitarian and research missions the world over. It can operate not only in Iraq and Afghanistan, but in places like Bosnia, Rwanda, the Sudan, and even Antarctica. But today I think it's taken for granted, and our commitments overseas, especially since 2001, have imposed far greater burdens on these aircraft than we had originally planned for. The Congressional Research Service reports that the C-17 was designed to fly 1,000 hours per year with an expected lifespan of 30 years. 
but as our overseas commitments have grown since 2001, the fleet has averaged 1,250 hours per aircraft and have even reached 2,400 flying hours in a single year. General Arthur Light, the Air Force's Air Mobility Commander, has said that at this rate, the C-17s may have a lifespan as short as 22 years. When a mission-critical aircraft is due to retire eight years earlier than intended, as this one will be, we who are charged with equipping our troops in the field must adjust our procurement plans, and we must do it now. Some of our newest C-17s are already 15 years old. I'd like to remind my colleagues that last July, the Senate voted 93 to 1 to authorize the expansion of the Army by 30,000 soldiers. I, along with nearly all of my colleagues, supported that increase to meet our growing security demands and relieve the combat burden on our already overstretched forces. But we took that vote. When we took that vote, Mr. President, we incurred an obligation as well to provide those troops with the support that they'll need in order to do their jobs. Chairman Dan Inouye and the members of the Senate Appropriations Committee have demonstrated incredible foresight by acting quickly to prevent these future shortfalls in this very important fleet. If this amendment to undo their good work prevails, we are doing a disservice to our troops. We are also doing a great disservice to our taxpayers. The author of this amendment has said that we should kill the C-17 now and wait for a government study down the road to see whether or not we need more of these aircraft. Well, if we kill the C-17, we will lose our only wide-body assembly line in the United States. According to the General Accountability Office, it'll cost up to $1 billion to restart the line when it inevitably draws on us, when it dawns on us, dawns on us that we need the military cargo planes to support our troops in the field. And if we hand these three individuals and the 30,000 of their fellow workers around the country pink slips in the next few days, who do we think is going to build those planes down the road? By the way, if we choose to try and take up the capability by extending the lives of the C-5As, we need to overhaul or repair seven of them at a cost of nearly $1 billion to weaken what we're doing, what we're getting, by buying just one additional C-17 at a cost of $276 million. Mr. President, this amendment would hurt our workers, our troops, and our national security. It is a massive expenditure disguised as a short-term savings. It is the very definition of cutting off our nose to spite our face when it comes to the critical needs of our troops in the field. Whatever views you may have on Afghanistan or on Iraq, we want to make sure that our troops, wherever they are, have the capability of receiving the support that they need. By depriving them of this aircraft, by depending upon an aircraft that's getting older and older and older by the day, and no ideas of replacing them at all, we put these troops and our national security at risk. And so, Mr. President, while there is a parochial interest, I acknowledge that, there's a far broader one that's confined to the borders of my state. This issue goes far beyond the limitations of one jurisdiction. It goes to our very capabilities as a nation to respond, both in terms of military capacity as well as humanitarian needs. The fact that 86% of these aircraft are ready, as opposed to only 53% of the C-5s, the fact that we can land this aircraft in as many diverse places as we can. And the alternative is very limited indeed. It seems to me these arguments ought to prevail. And today when the vote occurs, I would urge my colleagues to support the committee, those who have done the work on this, who understand what is at stake, and reject the amendment that would cut out these aircraft. And with that, Mr. President, I now ask consent that I be allowed to move to a matter other than the ones I've just uh, discussed.